Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome on this rainy day. Um, we're delighted to have you with us today for our program. Um, this is the start of the second half of our series on commemorating the Constitution of 1818. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs here at the Old State House, and we are very delighted to welcome you to this program today. Um, since the Constitutional Convention for that, for the Constitution of 1818 took place in our very building, so good to have you here. We're delighted to have our co-sponsors of this program series here today, Connecticut Explored, the magazine of Connecticut history. Um, at the back of the room are two recent issues of the magazine, and I would invite you to help yourself to them. They are a great read, and I'd like to invite Elizabeth Norman from Connecticut Explored to just step forward and say a few words. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to, this is the fourth, like three, three in from the spring, three in the fall. Uh, we are collaborating with a lot of different partners to commemorate the Constitution of 1818. I was at a meeting recently where a um, academic kind of accused some people of celebrating the Constitution of 1818. I was like, well, I think we're commemorating it. There's some things to celebrate. There are definitely some things to not celebrate. Uh, and in the issue that we have, the fall issue that's out back here, uh, you, will, you will find a mix of that. And uh, including my publisher's letter where I point out a couple of pretty glaring areas where I felt the Constitution felt quite short. Uh, but there's a very, very exciting pullout poster of the entire text of the Constitution, which I know you will all want to immediately pull out and put up on your wall. Uh, so that uh, I got that idea from the New York Times when they published the U.S. Constitution in full in an insert on July 4th, two years ago, and uh, we worked with the Connecticut Supreme Court Historical Society who provided some annotations that, that are uh, on that, so it's not just the text. So um, we're providing those to middle schools and high school students. We're hoping a lot of uh, kids will be studying the Constitution of 1818, and to quote Wesley Horton, who was an earlier speaker, it's relevant because much of that constitution is what we're still using today. And if you want to hear more from him, you, I think you can get it on your website. But we've also turned the first three talks into podcasts on grading the nutmeg, which we do with the state historian, Walt Woodward. And the next three will be part of that series as well. So you can listen to it. Uh, grading the nutmeg is available on all of your iTunes, your iTunes and podcasting outlets. So uh, we're looking forward to. Uh, hearing today's talk, and again, thank you for and, uh, being here and pick up a copy of the magazine and read more about the Constitution of 1818. Thank you, Elizabeth. We've really enjoyed partnering with Connecticut Explored on this um, program series. We also want to thank um, our series funders, Connecticut Humanities, for their support. Um, They've been very generous in supporting our programs here at Connecticut's Old State House. I did want to just remind you to please make sure to fill out the surveys that are on your chairs. We actually do read them and get ideas for other programs. And there's also information about the last two programs in our program series. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, we are filming this um, program today, and you can watch it on um, the OSH YouTube channel, or you can listen to it as a podcast through Grading the Nut. Meg. And then after our program today, I would invite you to join us. We are going to do a themed tour of the old state house, which should take maybe about 45 minutes or so. Um, that is focused on how our building relates with the 1818 Constitution. And if you're interested in coming on that tour, just meet me in the Great Hall after we finish up the program. Today's program is entitled The Constitution of 1818, a Milestone in Church-State Relations in Connecticut. I'm especially excited to um, hear today's program because it seemed just a few months ago that I was in a meeting with our speaker who, and as he mentioned, um, some of the research he was doing, my little antenna went up and I said, oh, we have to have him speak here. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Robert J. Imholt here today. He, um, Bob is a native of the Midwest. He received a Southern education at Washington and Lee University in Virginia and at the University of Kentucky. Some fit of divine whimsy uh, sentenced him to life in New England, his words, not mine, as a member of the history department at Albertus Magnus College. He is a past president of the New England Historical Association, and he's published a number of articles on Connecticut in the early republic. Most recently, 
he published an article, Connecticut Confronts the Guillotine, the French Revolution and the Land of Steady Habits that appeared in a sub, uh, September 2017 issue of the New England Quarterly. Bob also just uh, completed an essay on religious disestablishment in Connecticut for a collective work to be published by the University of Missouri Press in January. His current project is a, a biographical study of Timothy Dwight, poet, preacher, and president of Yale from 1795 until his death in 1870. Please join me in welcoming Bob. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Okay. Um, let me begin with a caveat. The title would be more accurate if the subtitle had a question mark at the end of it. Okay. Um, if historians say anything about the Constitution of 1818, it is that the Constitution ended the establishment of the Congregational Church in the state. Assigning disestablishment to a specific date and attributing it to a specific document might satisfy our desire for historical clarity, a clear divide between the before and after, but it also suggests a battle between church and state, between winners who look, to, who look towards the future and uh, losers who basically look towards the past, okay? But history is never so simple. As they might say in the movies, it's complicated. The standard interpretation both overemphasizes uh, the hold of congregationalism prior to 1818 and oversimplifies the evolution of church-state relations in Connecticut both before and following the Constitution's ratification. It also overstates the importance of religion in the debates on the uh, the Constitution of 1818 itself. The contemporary phrase church-state relations suggests a dualism that would have been foreign to the Connecticut's founders. The 17th century Puritan saw um, questions of religion and government as inextricably intertwined. Divine law is embodied in scripture with the foundation of civil law uh, was the foundation of civil law and the role of governing institutions was among our worldly concerns to protect and sustain the ecclesiastical ones. In Windsor, Hartford, and Wethersfield, the churches were formed, formed either before settlers arrived or soon after. It was not until 18, 19, uh, 1639 that the residents approved the fundamental orders of Connecticut. It was drafted according to the document itself. Okay. Um, uh, because the word of God requires that to maintain the peace and union of such a people, there be an orderly and decent government established according to God. More specifically, it was to maintain and preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord, which we now profess, and also the discipline of the churches, which according to the truth of the gospel is now practiced among us. The establishment of New ha the New Haven colony followed a similar path. The law codes of both came directly from the book of Leviticus. In sum, the role and function of government was to assist the churches in fashioning a godly society. The mutual dependency of religion and the state was a constant during Connecticut's first two centuries. We emphasized every year at the annual election sermon preached before the governor, the general assembly, and clergy. In May 1790, for example, Nathan Strong, pastor of Hartford's first church right down the street, declared that as regards the civil and ecclesiastical departments, um, neither of them is independent of the other, okay? Um, uh, neither of them is independent of the other. Civility and good order of political re regulations are a great advantage to religion, and its institutions are the best aid of government by strengthening the ruler's hand and making the subject faithful in his place and obedient to general laws. 
the General Assembly itself in October 1798 recognized this mutual dependency when it declared uh, the, the state, uh, when it declared these ancient laws and institutions of this state, and especially those which relate to the observation of the Sabbath and the morals and manners of the people, are deeply and inextricably, uh, are deeply sensibly sensible and wisely calculated to form habits of virtue, to promote the social order, and of consequence to support our free and happy constitution of government by producing prompt and voluntary obedience to the laws greatly contributed to the peace and prosperity of the state. Consensus on the interdependence of civil society and ecclesiastical one, however, did not guarantee a peaceful world. Two problems quickly uh, presented themselves. The first was a controversy. Oops, sorry, that was the, I, I pissed one, okay. The assembly undertakes the role of establishing churches halfway, um, the first controversy over whether the children of individuals who were not full members of a church should be baptized. The assembly wrestled with this issue as early as 1656. In 1664, it endorsed the baptism of offspring uh, of these halfway members and asked the churches for comment. The ensuing debate tore congregations apart. Those in the minority, uh, whether for the halfway covenant or against it, petitioned uh, the court for their own congregations. Dispute raged on, raged on until, 17, until 1669 when the General Assembly voted to allow congregations both with and without the halfway covenant until such, until they said, until such better light in an orderly way doth appear. And it, but it declared also that no new churches could be gathered without the consent of both the court and the neighboring churches. Connecticut was now a checkerboard of ecclesiastical societies with opposing practices. Most importantly, while the first settlements had formed ecclesiastical societies, churches, before the civil ones, now the assembly undertook the role of establishing ecclesiastical societies. Okay. The assembly's concern uh, that no new churches be formed without its consent was also a response to another problem. The settlers of the original, that of outlivers, the settlers of the original towns lived close to the meeting house. The Connecticut's original settlers were a remarkably procreative group, and as population grew, distribution of the common and undivided lands meant that more and more families moved farther from the town center. Attendance at public worship was often a burden for these outlivers. They demanded churches of their own. Establishing a separate church, however, meant that the burden of supporting the original society and its minister fell on fewer rate papers, payers. Given this dilemma, the assembly reluctantly, in most cases, and over the objection of the original society, created new parishes. Many towns now had several congregational churches. Being the arbiter of congregational disputes, however, was not a role that the colonial government found uh, comfortable. In 1708, Gurdon Saltonstall was elected governor. One of his first acts was to call for a synod to consider and agree upon those methods and rules for the management of ecclesiastical discipline conformable to the word of God. Meeting in Saybrook, the synod organized churches into local associations with a colony-wide association uh, presiding fi providing uh, final oversight. The local associations would oversee the orthodoxy of individual churches and serve as an arbiter of par parochial disputes, relieving the General Assembly of the task. In October uh, 1708, the Assembly declared their great uh, approbation of such a happy agreement 
and ordained that all churches within the government that are or shall be uni or shall be are united in doctrine, worship, and discipline, and for the future shall be owned and established by law. Wishful thinking at best, all churches did not accept the Saybrook platform. Two other early 18th century developments are also fundamentally altered church government relations. One was the issue of money. While initially ministers were to be supported by voluntary contributions, by the 1640s, Connecticut made the setting of a minister's rate the responsibility of the towns. While some clearly met their obligation, collecting from others was difficult. Recognizing the problem, the legislature in 1697 placed responsibility for collection on magistrates. In 1777, the assembly placed primary responsibility for church rates on the ecclesiastical societies themselves, okay? rather than the towns. Each parish was, quote, to levy rates and taxes on the inhabitants for the support of ministry and schools and to appoint collectors. While scoff laws could be reported to the civil authorities for collection, reluctance of parishioners to pay taxes for a minister's salary rarely came to court. A second development early in the 18th century was the end of Connecticut's isolation from the larger world of the British Empire. Britain was no longer a place to escape from as it was to Connecticut's first settlers, but a cultural and uh, economic capital both cultivated and admired. In turn, Britain took greater interest in its colonies. In 1705, for example, the Crown out, uh, vetoed the law, Connecticut's law against Quakers. Feeling pressure from England and wanting to safeguard the 1662 Charter, in 1707, the General Assembly adopted a Toleration Act, which granted rights to sober dissenters while retaining disabilities on heretics and Catholics. Connecticut also saw the beginnings of increased denominational diversity. In 1705, a Baptist church was framed in, formed in Groton, and in 1718, an Anglican church formed in Stratford. A few dissenting churches did not provide a significant challenge to the standing order. In 1722, however, the establishment was shaken when the Yale president, Timothy Cutler, and two tutors informed the trustees that they had converted to Anglicanism. This drew the attention of the Bishop of London. In 1724, he wrote, wrote Governor Talcott inquiring why, why Anglicans were being taxed to support the congregational churches. Talcott defended the tax in his reply, but in 1727, the legislature allowed Anglican parishes to tax their own members. Two years later, a similar privilege was granted to Baptists and Quakers. Finally, in 1777, the privilege to tax was extended to all Protestant churches. Connecticut no longer had an established church, but what historian John Butler has called multiple establishment. In the early 1740s, the religious revival known as the Great Awakening delivered another blow to religious uniformity. In the colony, um, in the colony, a blow from which it never recovered. Following the path of revival brought about by Jonathan Edwards in Northampton and uh, the Great Awakening upset religious life in town after town. In New Haven, for example, revival preacher James Davenport argued that James Noyes, the pastor of the First Ecclesiastical Society of New Haven, did not believe that divine grace was necessary for salvation. The congregation split between new lights, backers of uh, the revival, and old lights, supporters of noise. Across the green at Yale, David Brainerd ex was expelled for yelling that Tudor Chauncey Whittlesley had no more grace than a chair. Throughout the state, significant numbers left the established churches upset over the chaotic nature of the congregational system and moved to Anglicanism. Still others left the established churches 
and became Baptists or uh, Baptists or dis members established dissenting congregations of their own. Throughout Connecticut, congregational ministers found themselves in a pitched battle to hold the center of religious culture rapidly coming apart at the seams. A new normalcy, however, was soon established. Larger towns and many smaller ones now had churches of two and three denominations. More significantly, the Great Awakening marked the ascendancy of individual experience over corporate discipline, a tendency which only grew with the American Revolution. Puritanism, like most faiths, had sought to control human selfishness by obliterating the individual uh, through stern subordination to the good of the community. The new age was that of the self-made man. To Timothy Dwight, the revolution opened up a veritable Pandora's box of evils from infidelity to avarice, ambition, and luxury. Enlightenment ideas emphasized the primacy of reason, not faith. Deism, Unitarianism, Universalism were now openly professed as rational religions. While clergy were esteemed before the revolution, in 1787, New Haven lawyer David Daggett mourned the loss of this happy influence of the clergy. The revolution also had an impact upon Connecticut law. At its May 1783 session, the General Assembly, as it had done on several times since the 17th century, authorized a revision of the laws since it was now no longer a colony but a state. Roger Sherman and Richard Law were assigned the task of revising, quote, the statute laws of the state and making such alterations, additions, exclusions, and amendments as they deemed proper and expedient. The result by the General Assembly, the result was approved by the General Assembly in January 1784. There's a copy, front page of the laws, okay? The new law code made few changes in matters of religion. The code reasserted the position made by Connecticut's founders that the happiness of the people in the good order of civil society depend upon piety, religion, and morality, and that it was the duty of government to provide support and encouragement for churches. It reaffirmed the 1777 law that all Protestant churches shall have the same liberty and authority and powers and privileges as the established congregational churches. And the code reaffirmed the practice of the 1717 law that individual churches tax their own members. Since implementation required clarity as to membership, all residents were to be counted as members of religious society and could not change congregations unless they filed a certificate with their society and joined another. The unaffiliated were considered members of the established, that is, the congregational church in each town. Importantly, the Saybrook platform was no longer a part of the laws of Connecticut. Zephaniah Swift, the most prominent Connecticut jurist of the era, commented on the 1784 laws that here is a complete renunciation of the doctrine that an ecclesiastical establishment is necessary for the support of civil government. Focus on legal codes, however, obscures the powerful currents buffered in Connecticut religion uh, after the Revolution. Baptist churches, less than a dozen before the war, numbered 55 by 1790. Others moved to established churches, from established churches to the Episcopal or Methodist congregations. Because of inflation and the decline of the number of members, many congregational clergy resigned over salaries, and the number of clerical dismissals dramatically increased. In the light of these developments, the General Assembly in May 1791 modified the laws regarding church membership. Instead of simply filing a certificate to withdraw from a church, individuals wishing to change membership would now need to appear before town officials who would inquire whether those seeking to withdraw from a congregation were both attending and contributing to another. Okay. Popular opposition uh, erupted almost immediately. 
an anonymous contributor to, contributor to the Connecticut Current wrote, the certificate wall is as much worse than the act on tea as religious fetters are worse than civil. At the October session, the assembly repealed the law and reverted to the earlier practice of individuals simply filing a certificate to withdraw from a church. Having failed to buttress church finances in the certificate controversy, in 1793, the assembly voted to, that proceeds from the sale of the lands of Connecticut's Western Reserve in Ohio be placed in a fund to the support of ministry and schools of education. In the 1791 certificate law, there was a, like the 1791 certificate law, there was an immediate backlash. There were a number of concerns about the, the measure. Foremost was that the land had not yet been sold. Representative Charles Phelps likened it to a person who sold the bearskin before they caught the bear. At the next session of the assembly, there was unanimous support for funding education, but division raged over support for the, of ministry. Supporters of the act hoped that the endowment generated from the sale would be sufficient to forego taxes to support the ministry. Opponents argued that an endowment fund would make the clergy independent and no longer dependent on their congregations. To establish a separate order of men is contrary to the public good and to the real principles of republicanism. It was not until May 1795 that the issue was resolved. Support for the ministry was left out of the act and the fund was established for the support of schools. The, also, the act also took away power from the local established churches, which had responsibility for education, and lodged the authority in a separate co committee uh, in each town. Primary responsibility for shaping a Republican citizenry was passed, to the church, passed from the churches to the schools. What is clear then is that by the beginning of the 19th century, the Congregational Church as an institution no longer enjoyed a privileged position, legal position. Despite this, however, Congregational still enjoyed privileged social privileged social and political positions. Most members of the General Assembly and the judiciary were Congregationalists, as had been every governor. Congregationalists were dispro disproportionately represented uh, in commerce and in business professions. And most of these elites were graduates of Congregationalist Yale. Most vocal critics of Congressional domination, the dominance uh, were dissenters. John Cousin Ogden, an Anglican priest, published a pamphlet entitled An Appeal of the Candid on the Present State of Religion and Politics in Connecticut. According to Ogden, while the laws provided for religious freedom, the right is violated by the great disgrace to the state. His target was Timothy Dwight, the president of Yale, who was making great strides after universal control in Connecticut, New England, and the United States of religious opinion and politics. At this time, Connecticut is more completely under the administration of a pope than Italy. Though more restrained, the Baptists were consistent, uh, consistently critical of the so-called standing order. After the turn of the century, Connecticut's Baptists petitioned for an end to the certificate law and the end of taxes, the support of religion. Every year, the assembly rejected the petition. The 1802 Baptist petitions, for example, argued that all laws which oblige a man to worship in any particular mode or which compel him to pay taxes are tyrannical and unjust. In response, an assembly committee chaired by Oliver, Edward, Oliver Ellsworth, the former Chief Justice of the United States, reminded petitioners of the legislative responsibility to, quote, to countenance, aid, and protect religious institutions, widely calculated to direct men to the performance of all duties arising from their connection with each other. He compared taxes to the support of ministry to the support of schools. Even people without children had to pay taxes to support schools. The Jeffersonian Republicans in the state strongly supported the Baptist petitions. Gideon Granger, 
Postmaster General in Jefferson's cabinet even got Jefferson to write a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association expressing his support for building a wall of separation of church and state. The Jeffersonian Baptist Alliance, however, uh, was still born. Many prominent Connecticut Republicans like Abraham Bishop were like Jefferson himself, skeptical of many Orthodox Christian beliefs. As a political issue, therefore, this church state controversy disappeared for almost a decade. The waning of church state controversies did not mean, however, a stable religious environment. The period was full of the, the, saw the full flowering of new divinity theology, which placed greater emphasis on human ability to achieve salvation than traditional Calvinism. Concurrent for the faith of thousands of Connecticut Concern for the faith, faith of thousands of Connecticut residents who left the state for Vermont, New York, and places west, the assembly established the Missionary Society of Connecticut to support clergy in the new settlements. In 1800, the Missionary Society uh, established the Connecticut Evangelical Magazine. Not only did it report missionary successes in the new settlements, but also the activities of revival in Connecticut, particularly northwestern Connecticut, the Second Great Awakening. These years also saw the formation of the Connecticut Bible Society in 1809 and the founding of the Connecticut Society for the Promotion of Good Morals in 1812. Its aim was to promote good morals, to discourage profaneness, gross breaches of the Sabbath, idleness, and intemperance. Society was founded from recognition that government was no longer enforcing basic moral laws. As its founder, Lyman Beecher, declared, the government was not standing forth the watchful guardian of its own laws, as it is too much occupied with other concerns. The neglect of official, the of official duty is the very evil for which we now seek a remedy. By the early 19th century, denominational differences among evangelical sects paled in comparison with the threat to Christianity as a whole. Clergy responded to the rise of deism and atheism with the United Evangelical Front against infidelity. Timothy Dwight summarized this trend in his 1816 Yale commencement address. Within the last 20 years, a new order of things has arisen in the spiritual providence of God in several respects more wonderful than any which has taken place since the apostles' acts. Sects are, being, are losing their bigotry and their mutual alienation. What was emerging during this period was what sociologist Robert Bella, about 50 years ago, referred as America's civic uh, religion, a consensus on certain religious fundamentals without going into detail. Uh, this, this discussion of church-state relations uh, in Connecticut disappeared as the state and the nation entered the War of 1812. While opposition to the war in Connecticut was strong, Connecticut's Federalists were divided between those who grudgingly cooperated with the war and those who uh, opposition led them to support the Hartford Convention of 18, December 1814 held in this very room. The end of the war, however, created a veritable revolution in Connecticut political life. Okay. In 1814, a group of wealthy Hartford Episcopalians petitioned the legislature to charter a bank. As an incentive to approve the charter, investors, investors uh, offered the state a $50,000 bonus and recommended it be divided between and the medical college at Yale and an endowment fund to support the Episcopal bishop. The legislature approved $20,000 for Yale, but put the remaining $30,000 into the general fund. Episcopalians were outraged, especially as it came close on the heels of rejection of the establishment of an Episcopalian college that would later be Trinity. For many Federalists who had been supporters of the standing order, the bonus controversy broke those bonds. In February, February, in February 1816, okay, a group of Episcopalians, disillusioned Federalists, and Republicans gathered in New Haven to form the Toleration Party and endorsed candidates for the April elections. 
The gubernatorial nominee, Oliver Wolcott Jr., okay, was the son and grandson of former governors who had served as Secretary of the Treasury under Washington and Adams. While losing in Connecticut in 1816, by 1817, Walcott was governor, and in May 1818, Toleration Party won control of the assembly as well. With his new majority, Walcott called upon the assembly in May 1818 to hold a convention to draft a constitution for the state. In calling, the, um, calling for the constitution, the question of religion was largely avoided. As one of Governor Walcott's friends advised, the subject of religion was of such a delicate texture and should be approached with much caution and silence. While reference to the usages and customs of the people were common in the debates, there were few, rest, um, few references to church-state relations. The weeks, um, yep. let me see, I'm getting all my pages mixed up. The weeks between the end of the legislative session and the 4th of July election of delegates as, as well, there was no real discussion of religious questions. After delegate selection, uh, discussion of the religious question, re, Christian questions reappeared. John Davenport, in a letter to the current, wrote that the religious institutions of the state must be held sacred. A week later, a freeman warned that in the convention a great effort is to be made to destroy the ecclesiastical laws of the state, laws that cannot be dispensed with without uh, try laying an ax to the, at the root of the state's dignity, integrity, and highest social, moral, political, and religious interests and character. At the opening of the Constitutional Convention, again, we're in the building that, that housed it, Governor Walcott was elected president and a drafting committee under the leadership of Judge, uh, Federal Judge Pierpont Edwards was chosen. Walcott had already had a draft constitution which served as the basis for most of the constitution as finally adopted. Walcott, this draft, however, also tried to buttress the position of the state churches. Walcott proposed that towns that did not maintain weekly public worship of God would lose representation in the assembly and the right to vote for state offices. Walcott's draft would also retain taxes to support religion, even among uh, dissenters. While well, the drafting committee submitted to the convention, what the drafting committee submitted to the convention did not include these proposals. Religious issues appeared in two of the Constitution's 11 articles. Okay. The second and third sections of Article I, the Bill of Rights, okay, affirmed the exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and, wor profession and worship without discrimination shall for forever be free to all persons in the state, and that no preference shall be given to any law, uh, to any religious sect or mode of worship. The convention considerable debate over whether the wording uh, would place Mohammedanism, uh, paganism, and other forms of infidelity on an equal footing with Christianity. In the end, the section was amended to no preference for shall be given by law to any Christian sect or mode of worship. The entirety of Article 7 okay, uh, was devoted to religion. It began with the statement that it, being, that it was the duty of all men to worship the supreme being, the great creator and preserver of the universe. Elaborating on the rights set forth in the first article, it declared that no person shall by law be compelled to join or support nor be classed with any as, or associated uh, to any congregation, church, or religious society. This statement was followed by a clause that every person now belonging to a religious association shall remain a member thereof until they have separated himself therefrom. And every religious association retains the power to tax its members for the support of its minister and to cover expenses. Withdrawal requires simply filing a written notice with the society clerk. The statement that it was the duty of all men to worship the supreme being prompted heated for, for debate. Former Governor John Treadwell wondered whether it 
we have to open the possibility that man may think it is duty to worship as the Romans did. Alexander Wolcott suggested leaving the word of duty out altogether. On the question of taxes, Nathaniel Terry argued that the provision would leave churches destitute and that religion should be supported somewhere. Joshua Stowe responded, if a man is compelled to support public worship, he has the right to say what the public worship is, even worship of the devil. The article passed without amendment. The convention completed its work on September the 15th and set the first Monday of October for a referendum on it. The Hartford Times, which is supported the toleration clause, was satisfied. The rights of conscience have, been settled, conscience have been settled upon principles more liberal and satisfactory than we expected. A freeman writing in the current disagreed. The proposed constitution is designed to unchristian a large part of the community. An Episcopalian writing in the Connecticut Journal was equally pessimistic. If the constitution is approved and no person has to, is to be classed with or associated to any congregation, it is not freedom of conscience that it pr proposes, but the freedom to trample it in the earth and escape from the most sacred obligations of both God and men. Despite these warnings, the voters narrowly approved the new constitution. The constitution was ratified, but unclear what had changed. Connecticut now had a Bill of Rights, less cumbersome electoral system, a clear separation of powers. But what did Connecticut con the Constitution mean for the status of religion, its relationship to the state? Some things did change fairly quickly. In 1819, for example, congregational clergy still assembled in Hartford for the beginning, at the beginning of May for the annual election ceremonies. But they were joined by several Baptist ministers. After 1820, the legislature no longer provided dinner at government expense and ministerial attendance at the event began a steady decline. Laws governing religion, however, did not seem to change at all. The legislature established a committee, just like that of 1784, to revise the state statutes in light of the new constitution. The result was approved by the legislature in May 1821. The laws regarding the Sabbath and days of fast and thanksgiving were unchanged from the earlier law code. In the section on religious societies and congregations, church officers were annually to set a tax on the congregation's ministers with fines for dereliction of duty. Local officials were enjoined to, um, local officials were enjoined to see that the law was enforced. State mandated collections to support the Missionary Society of Connecticut continued one would have to read extended, an extended footnote. The footnote lasts almost two pages. To finally find the words, the people of this state have passed from religious establishment to perfect freedom. Several Connecticut Supreme Court cases illustrate the ways in which religion and the state were still intertwined. The case of Atwood, Atwood versus Welton, 1828, is a good example. The lawsuit arose over a loan. Uh, the issue was what, uh, before the appeals court, however, was whether, uh, uh, whether a witness who did not believe in the imprecation of divine vengeance if his testimony be false should be allowed to testify. Writing for the majority, Justice David Daggett held that he could not. Daggett explained, quote, Christianity is part of the common law of the land. Our ancestors brought it with them to the state, and there's no statute abrogating it. Nay, our statute public punishes by fine, imprisonment, and binding to good behavior persons guilty of blasphemy against God, either person of the Trinity, the Christian religion, or the Holy Scriptures. Profane swearing and the violation of the Sabbath are punished by fine. Our Constitution declares it to be the duty and obligation of all men to worship the Supreme Being according to the dictates of their conscience. These provisions do not look like annulling Christianity. The law does not, and does not indeed prescribe any rules of faith, no mode of worship, nor attempt to enforce any practical piety. It simply recognizes the great doctrines of Christianity and preserves them from open assaults of their enemies. An effort by the legislature to overturn the decision failed. 
To understand disestablishment in Connecticut, then, the desire for specific dates and specific actions must be put aside. Disestablishment was a complex process occurring for over a century. The congregational monopoly ended in the late 1720s when Anglican, Quaker, and Baptist societies retained the authority to collect their own rates. The First Great Awakening and the explosion of sex compounded the difficulty of maintaining government control of religious life. The exclusion of the Saybrook platform from the 1784 revi revision of the laws for some was disestablishment. The 1818 Constitution was important, but as to religion, it simply embedded existing law in practice in the state's fundamental law. Long after ratification of the new Constitution, Protestant Christianity pervaded the laws and civic life of the state. Thank you. Okay. I'd be happy to take any questions or whatever. Yes, Mary. Not, not being a New Englander, I don't know the answer to what was happening in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. If Connecticut's waiting till 1818 to disestablish the Congregational Church, what happened in those other two New England neighbors? Well, in, in Rhode Island, it's very simple. They really never really had an established church, okay? Uh, and basically, they had sort of freedom, but churches, Part of the problem is, is if you don't have an established church, churches own property. They collect money, they spend money, they have to be incorporated and things like this. So even if you have sort of no sort of laws mandating religion, basically, you know, the state is involved with religion. So in Rhode Island, basically, it was sort of going all the way back to Roger Williams, there was a certain freedom. Massachusetts didn't disestablish religion until 1833. Um, so basically, but to some extent, it was the same problem as Connecticut. Uh, Massachusetts had a constitution in 1780. And basically, you know, practice, you know, practice in Massachusetts changed like was practice in Connecticut. Now you had lots of atheists and people who never went to church and sort of everything else. And you had, especially in Massachusetts, the huge growth of Unitarianism. And all of that basically, well, fine, but basically that's simply the way we are, and the law doesn't reflect that. It's finally in 1833 that somehow they passed the law and sort of, sort of ended, you know, made it official, basically, it's, it's disestablished. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's interesting. Uh, New Hampshire didn't disestablish until 1819, you know, but they already had a constitution, and so it was done by legislature. Any questions or observations? Yeah. One of the issues that uh, doesn't seem to be in the Constitution, I haven't looked at it in a while, <clears throat> was the uh, separation of the school system from the religious system. How did that affect this Constitution? Well, the schools and that are mentioned in the Constitution. Basically, it's sort of a different, it's not anything in the religion. The very important, what is important here is, as I say, in 1795, the Connecticut legislature established the school fund. Uh, actually, that law uh, basically has come into a lot of more modern Connecticut Supreme Court decisions, such as Sheck versus O'Neill, and basically what's the right of the state and schools and everything else is. Um, but in essence, it's, it's sort of a, you know, what do you do when large numbers of people aren't going to church or they're going to all court of different denominations? How do, in, in our republic, and how do we educate citizens? You know, in the 17th century, well, it's the church that's creating basically people who obey laws and people who are good community members and everything else. Now the question becomes is how do you sort of do this? Well, 1795, in a sense, they established this, every town had to establish its own school board. And it was in, now put in charge of the school, where previously that was the same uh, sort of board of elders that ran, and the minister that ran the local schools. Um, you know, so this is, you know, it was really taken away from them. The churches were, 
in many ways, we're so unstable as to providing that uh, because we're beginning to have problems where large numbers of congregational churches, uh, I'm thinking of one church in particular that went three years before it could find another minister. Well, if the minister's in charge of education, how can you have the schools? You know, so basically this was, you know, um, you know, even the, uh, the state uh, consociation, basically, of ministers was constantly complaining about the huge num in the 1790s, the huge number of unfilled parishes, the parishes that didn't have ministers. Uh, and this is just congregational. Yeah. Um, so that, hopefully that answers your question there. Thank you, it does. Yeah. Any other questions or observations or objections, I mean? No, it, you know, it's been a very intriguing study. Actually, you know, um, there was another Supreme Court case in the 1850s, 1854, and it concerns the, a suit by the Second Ecclesiastical Society of Portland against the First Ecclesiastical Society of Portland. Uh, and basically, they sued, and the Supreme Court uh, was, it had five members at that point in time, and the decision was 3-2. Uh, three members basically said, well, basically, these are corporations. We're dealing this with this under corporation law. The other two members basically said, no, what the legislature did in creating these churches uh, was perfectly legal. It's, they're not corporations, they're churches. And, you know, and if Connecticut had meant to disestablish religion in 1818, they should have said so. You know, uh, the Constitution said it said so. Actually, the words duty of all individuals to um, worship the supreme being and the idea that Christian equality were not removed from the Federal Connecticut Constitution until 1965. Although in 1841, I think it was that they allowed, uh, they permitted Jewish, uh, gave Jews equal, Jewish synagogues equality too, yeah, by legislature. That was a big issue and it was one of the big issues at the convention in 1965. Any other questions or observations? Well, thank you very much. I hopefully you got. Yeah.